Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to have everyone here this evening uh, for what I think is going to be a really quite interesting, in fact, completely intriguing discussion uh, of a little-known uh, aspect of uh, Rabbi Schneerson's life. Uh, I'm Jonathan Brent. Executive Director of the Evo Institute, and it's a pleasure now to welcome Fruma Moore, our uh, senior archivist, and Lyudmila Sholokhova, who is uh, the director of the Evo Archive and Library. You have to adjust this volume. Okay. Uh, here to introduce the rest of the program. Thank you. Fruma Mila. Uh, good evening. Dr. Mila Shalakhova, Director of the Hebrew Archives and Library, and I, Fruma Morer, Senior Archivist at YIVO, would like to welcome you all to tonight's YIVO's Ruth Gay Seminar in Jewish Studies. Tonight's audience includes members of the academic community and the general public. And we'd also like to welcome members of the Schneerson family. Who are here tonight, as well as members of the Felsenberg family. Some of whose relations miraculously survived the war in Rabbi Schneerson's children's home. And who experienced at close hand the benefits of Rabbi Zalma Schneerson's continuous rescue and resistance activities, the subject of tonight's program. Before introducing tonight's subject and the speakers, we would like to express our deepest thanks and public appreciation to the family of Ruth Gay, the noted American Jewish historian and writer who passed away in 2006. Thanks to a major and generous gift from Ruth Gay's family, in 2008, the Ruth Gay Seminar in Jewish Studies was established and is given three times a year by scholars who have used the resources of the Evo archives and who wish to share their research with the public. We are fortunate to have in our midst tonight members of Ruth Gay's family, including Shirley Gornstein, sister of Ruth Gay, Sarah Heduri, uh, daughter of Ruth Gay, and Elizabeth Glazer, daughter of Ruth Gay, and Margaret Gorenstein, daughter-in-law of Shirley Gorenstein. Please join me in recognizing and applauding the family of Ruth Gay for its very significant contribution to this major EVA educational program. Our particular thanks to Jonathan Brandt, whose strong support for the Ruth Gay Seminar has been a major factor in its long-term success and popularity. The staff of the Yivo Institute and the Center for Jewish History, including Alex Weiser, Director of Programs, and Jane Tashinsky, Assistant Program Director, Eti Goldwasser, dedicated and committed co coordinator of the Ruth Gay Seminar for many years, and Eddie Sullivan, the CGH AV technician, for his indispensable assistance in setting up the technical aspects of the program and in videotaping the event. The story of Rabbi Schneer Zalman Schneerson and his rescue activities during the Holocaust in France is very important to Yivo where the papers of Rabbi Schneerson have been held since the mid-1950s. Rabbi Schneerson donated his papers to YIVO because he felt that YIVO, a great center of Holocaust research and one of the most important centers of documentation on the Holocaust in France, was the ideal institution where his papers could be preserved and studied. Thanks to the support of the YIVO Board of Directors and the the director and CEO, Jonathan Brent, and due to the generosity of the Fondation pour la Mémoire de la Shoah in Paris and the Mémoire de la Shoah Centre de Documentation Juive Contemporaine in Paris, and the executive director, whose executive director, Jacques Frege, 
and with the support of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, Rabbi Schneerson's papers were reorganized, processed, and microfilmed. And what you see on the screen is the new resulting finding aid, which is a result of the collective work of YIVO staff in the 1960s, the archival work of Harriet Jackson, who was our main speaker tonight, and the creation of an electronic enhanced version of the finding aid by the Center for Jewish History archivist Rachel Harrison, supervised by Andre Filimonov and Rachel Miller. Before introducing our speakers, we would like to share with you some information about YIVO's unique French Holocaust archive, probably unparalleled in its scope and significance. The French Holocaust archives at YIVO includes records of the General Union of the Jews of France, a large archive which holds many hundreds of thousands of papers, including original police copies of practically the entire census of the Jews of France, which was conducted department by department under Nazi decree. The papers of the Jewish chaplain Rabbi Renesh Hirschler, who helped countless Jewish inmates in the internment camps and who was deported with his wife to Auschwitz and died there. The records of underground relief organization Rue Amel Law, the original diary of Jewish writer Jacques Bielinki, the territorial collection on France Holocaust period, which includes documents of all aspects of the Jewish French experience during World War II. The collection of eyewitness accounts of the Holocaust with testimonies by French Jewish survivors. And of course, the papers of Rabbi Zalman Schneerson. The scope and wide range of subjects covered by Yiva's French Holocaust archive, taken as a whole, is what enhances its importance as evidence of the facts of the Holocaust in France and its unique usefulness as a research tool. The documents throw light on every aspect of the wartime period in France, daily life in internment camps, deportation, activities of Jewish resistance groups, the German occupation, and the policies and decrees of the Jewish government, the attitudes of Jewish leaders, French politicians, the church, and everyday Frenchmen. In fact, he was vast resources on the Holocaust contributed to the Nazi hunter search Klarsfeld's systematic list of all deportations from France to death camps, such as Auschwitz, with names of victims and date of deportation. Klarsfeld's frequent visits to Yivo played a role in his significant results in And now the speakers. Our main speaker tonight, Harriet Jackson, earned an MPhil in History and French Studies at New York University. She also studied for several years in France at the Sorbonne in Paris and the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales. Her master's essay examined popular anti-Semitism in France between the two world wars. And during her career in academic publishing at Columbia University and Gale, she worked with some of the world's greatest historians and together they help pioneer digital historical archives and databases for teaching American, European, and world history, as well as the civil rights movement. Harriet Jackson worked at YIVO as the archivist of the Zalman Schneerson papers and organized and rearranged the collection. Harriet organized a conference on Jewish rescue in 2011 at Columbia University with Professor Emeritus Robert Paxton the proceedings, which included a published paper by Harriet Jackson about Rabbi Schneerson, were edited by Professor Emeritus Vicky Karen as a special issue of French Politics, Culture, and Society, Volume 30, Issue 2, Summer 2012. Harriet Jackson currently works at Teachers College, Columbia University. Our second speaker, Hadassah Ne Schneerson Karlebach daughter of Rabbi Schneerson will share some of her personal experiences with us. She is an educator and public speaker about the Holocaust, reaching out to both young people and adults. Born in Leningrad in 1927, where her family suffered persecution in the hands of the communist regime, 
She left Soviet Russia in 1935 for Palestine with her parents, Rabbi and Mrs. Schneer Zalman and Sarah Schneerson. In 1936, the family left for France. From 1940 to 1945, Hadassah was involved in underground rescue efforts organized by her father, Rabbi Schneerson. Among her numerous activities, Hadassah worked in various children's homes established by her father in the south of France. Her underground work included supervising young children being transported from the Zwishi area to Marseille. While in semi-hiding in Marseille, Hadassah continued to take care of young children who had been separated from, the, from their parents. She also rode her bike from hiding place to hiding place, delivering medicine and food to the children. Hadassah worked in the Chateau de Signebon, helping with hay and the raising chickens and other farm work. In Grenoble, department officer, a French Alps, Hadassah was responsible for a group of children aged 4 to 11 and prepared children to be smuggled out of France into Switzerland. In 1945, after the liberation of France, Hadassah helped her father, Rabbi Schneerson, in a massive search for hidden children who might have been left in the care of Christian homes. In 1947, Hadassah immigrated United States with her parents, married uh, Rabbi Elihaim Karlebach and raised her family in New Jersey and taught young children at the Jewish Educational Center in Elizabeth, New Jersey. For the past 10 years, Hadassah has been combining her visits to her grandchildren and great-grandchildren with frequent public speaking engagements on the events of the Holocaust. Our respondent, Dr. Mordechai Paldiel, is a professor of Holocaust studies at Yeshiva University and the author of 11 books primarily on the subject of rescue activities during the Holocaust with focus on the history of righteous Gentiles. He was the Yad Vashem director of the Righteous Among the Nations department and was instrumental in awarding the righteous title to many non-Jewish rescuers of Jews of the Holocaust. Born in Belgium, Dr. Paldiel spent part of his childhood in France and found refuge for a brief time in one of the children's homes of Rabbi Zalman Schneerson. His family was eventually helped by a priest to make their escape to Switzerland. His most recent publication, To Save One's Own, published in 2017, deals with Jews helping fellow Jews to survive the Shoah with a chapter on Rabbi Schneerson. Please note that after the presentation, there will be a brief question and answer period, so we will rearrange the chairs, so please be patient and don't leave the auditorium. The chairs will be rearranged in panel mode, and the, uh, all the speakers will come up, and there will be a question and answer period in the auditorium, after which you are all invited to proceed directly to the Great Hall to partake of light refreshments and to have an opportunity to speak to tonight's speakers. And uh, the QA will be run either by Mila or by Etty or myself, you know, we'll see. And now let us welcome Harriet Jackson to the podium. And welcome, thank you so much for coming to this um, talk about the extraordinary case of Rabbi Zalman Schneerson. And I hope this presentation is as extraordinary as he was. And I would like to thank Jonathan Brent, um, Fruma Mora, Mila Sholochava, Etty Goldwasser, Etty, I'm sorry, Etty Goldwasser, um, Etty Sullivan, and in particular, I would like to thank the family of Ruth Gay for making this series um, possible. And I'd like you to know that 20 years ago, I met your mother at Yale, and she was kind, she was supportive, and I wish I had the opportunity to get to know her better. So it's a personal honor 
for me to be a part of this series that you're supporting, so thank you so much. And um, it's an extraordinary opportunity for me to talk about a subject that is dear to my heart. I, I am just so grateful to Fruma for having hired me 12 years ago to work on this collection, which is in the archival world known as RG340, RG4 Record Group. And its official name is the Kehilat Haharedim. Its French name is the Association des Israelites Pratiquants, which means the association, the associate, oh, the association of practicing Jews. And something just happened to the mic. <laughs> All right, um, I think it's back on. Good, thank you. So I will be referring to the social service agency that Rabbi Schneerson founded and directed between 1936 and 1947 as the AIP. And um, I am grateful to Mila and Fruma for giving a detailed explanation of the importance of the collections, the archival collections at YIVO on Jews in France. During the time when the papers having to do with Vichy were, um, were closed, they were not available to historians, many historians came to YIVO to do their research. For example, um, Professor Robert Paxton would not have been able to do his work on Jews in Vichy, France without consulting the archival material here at YIVO. So that's to show you just how important these collections are. And I was very lucky to have been hired to catalog the records of Rabbi Schneerson's AIP. And there are 40 boxes, 40 bankers boxes, which is huge. It's thousands, it includes thousands and thousands of pages, and it's invaluable for historians, um, also genealogists, so anyone who wants to get um, a good grasp on daily life for children or for interned Jews, this is the collection to go to. And if you are looking for perhaps information about your family, the letters, from the interned Jews that are classified by the name of the camps in which they were interned, they are available and I suggest that you consult these, these, these letters or the, the collection and you tell everyone you know about how important this collection is. And it's important for me to pay tribute to Rabbi Zalman Schneerson and to his family and to his daughter who is here, Hadassah Kalbach. And one of the most, uh, the driving force for my interest in Rabbi Schneerson was the fact that he was so passionate about Judaism and that during the war he was absolutely fearless and being able to practice Judaism, to give joy to the children who was in his like, orphanage, this meant so much to me and I was able to understand what spiritual, spiritual resistance really meant. And my um, second um, objective in working on Rabbi Schneerson was to integrate the, the story about his resistance work and to integrate it into the larger scholarship uh, by mainstream historians on Vichy France or Jews in Vichy France and to include this kind of spiritual resistance work in the larger definition of resistance which at first only included those who took up arms um, and then it included um, men who did surveillance, reconnaissance missions, and then by the 70s and 80s, 
the definition of resistance expanded to include women's work, such as riding a bicycle as Hadassah Kalbach did when she was a teenager, riding a bicycle when being out in public could have threatened your life and she was out bicycle riding in order to deliver medicine, for example. So, so these are examples of um, resistance and also the fact that Rabbi uh, Zalman Schneerson, his wife Sarah, and, and the children could bring joy, bring joy to these children who had been ripped apart from their families and that they were traumatized. The fact that they could give them some sort of joy and semblance of a family life I think is invaluable and is part, again, of this larger definition of resistance. So now I will proceed to um, read my, my script. And first of all, I just want to show you some photographs. So this is Rabbi Zalman Schneerson. Um, this is Sarah, his wife, Rabbi and Sarah Schneerson. Um, this is Hadassah and her brother Sholem Bear, and I'm sorry that he passed away a few years ago. Um, again, this is another photograph of Hadassah. Um, this is uh, Raymond Raoul Lambert, one of my favorite French um, Jews, and I will explain why. And then I will refer to two historians, Zoza Tchaikovsky and Leon Polyakov. So you probably all have heard of Leon Polyakov because he was a well-known historian of anti-Semitism. And for sure, those who have studied French history or Jews in French history know the work of Zoza Tchaikovsky, who was an archivist at YIVO. And he was largely responsible for bringing those invaluable collections about Jews in France to YIVO, and he was actually the first person, uh, the first person, the first archivist to catalog the papers, those 40 boxes that were donated by Rabbi Zalman Schneerson in the late 50s. So here we go, this extraordinary rabbi, um, and, and I think it must have been a, a, a quite a sight to see Rabbi Schneerson, here he is, a Hasidic Jew from the Soviet Union. He, he, looks, uh, he looks Hasidic, he's wearing a black hat, the long black kaftan, he has the long beard. And I think that it takes um, integrity and also courage to be proud of looking Jewish in a society under Vichy France when being Jewish was um, brought humiliation to say, the, to say the least. Now, it is Leon Polyakov, so the world famous historian of anti-Semitism, in his memoirs, he said that Rabbi, Rabbi Schneerson was a larger than life character who many found fascinating. So I'm not saying this, this is the historian Leon Polyakov saying this because he knew Rabbi Schneerson very well. And he said that Rabbi Schneerson was, um, that even Vichy bureaucrats and police were not immune to his charm and charisma. So I want to underline that. We are talking about government officials in Vichy and the police. So one of um, the rabbi's admirers was um, Raymond Raoul Lambert, the quintessentially classy and assimilated French Jewish leader who staunchly defended Jewish refugees during the interwar years and the occupation. Lambert spoke highly of Schneerson's relief activities for the refugees, both before and during the war. So I will explore the relief rescue and resistance activities of Rabbi Schneerson and the social service agency uh, the AIP, which I, I, I had said he founded and directed between 1936 and 1947. And he, um, as I'm sure many of you or most of you know, he was a descendant of the distinguished Schneerson dynasty from the Lubavitcher 
sect of Hasidism. He was a Soviet emigre in France between 1935 and, and no, he was a Soviet emigre. And my thesis is that Schneerson's personal experience of communist repression and arrest, his participation in clandestine activities and spiritual resistance in the Soviet Union before he came to France, his fierce anti-communism, he hated communists, placed him, well, because of the persecution he suffered under Stalin, so this experience, this clandestine experience, placed him in a better position than many of his French brethren to deal with the authoritarian regime of Vichy and its, unfortunately, anti-Jewish policies. So prior to 1940, French Jews, in contrast to many of their foreign co-religionists, had not encountered state-sponsored anti-Semitism. Before Vichy, France was a democracy called the Third Republic. And in that democracy, Jews could thrive and reach the highest echelons of, of the, um, the French state, the bureaucracy, the military, and the state protected Jews. It did not persecute Jews. And so that is why I, well, Many historians argue that the French Jewish leaders were not ready to deal with the oppressive and then deadly regime of Vichy France. So, but, but Jews from Eastern and Central Europe were, all, were used to and had the experience of state persecution. So they were sort of on the forefront of the resistance movement. Now, one of the things that I would like to highlight is that Schneerson, I mean, it just amazes me that within one year of coming to Paris, he set up uh, two elementary schools. He set up two um, synagogues. He set up soup kitchens. There were thousands of impoverished Jewish refugees in France, and he was able to provide, he meaning the AIP, was able to provide 400 meals per day. And this, it's huge. And this enterprise was funded by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, also known affectionately as the Joint. So, Within one or two years of his coming to France, he became involved with the main refugee organizations, both in France and then also internationally. He was able to be at this nexus of, um, of relief organizations. Um, excuse me. So the one point or another point that I'd like to make, in addition to the relief work, is the rescue work. And that Schneerson and his family were able to house, to feed, and to educate more than 80 children during the war. That they were able to save at least 50 children from deportation and help smuggle at least 35 children to Switzerland demonstrates that he participated in an international network of rescue and resistance. That Schneerson, this is what I argue, that Schneerson and his family were able to survive and help Jewish refugees in Vichy, France, under a regime that willingly deported nearly half, nearly half of its foreign Jewish population to death camps, demonstrates that he and his wife, Sarah, were not novices in clandestine work. In fact, they brought from the Soviet Union their prior resistance training, which was a legacy, excuse me, a legacy of Hasidic resistance to popular anti-Semitism. Now, historians have largely overlooked the, not Leon Polyakov, other historians, have largely overlooked the work of Schneerson's wartime 
achievements. And it might be because they tend to study secular subjects. As early as 1966, Zoza Tchaikovsky, and you see him here with um, another um, archivist of YIVO, Hanna Mlotek, who really founded the music collection. So here Zoza is in his American GI outfit, outfit, I mean uniform, excuse me. And he, as early as 1966, said that the rabbis in France worked hard as, as social workers, that they did incredible work and that their work has not been acknowledged. And when I was working um, on the scholarship having to do with Rabbi Schneerson, I saw that indeed that remained largely true um, and, and current. So historians, um, uh, I guess, have a, a bias for looking at secular, excuse me, secular subjects, and which is why it was important to me when I put on that conference with Rabbi Paxton to, to really underscore the importance of Rabbi Schneerson's work and to integrate it in the larger historiography and the larger scholarship on, on resistance and Vichy France. I just need to take... Sorry about that. So, now I'm going to um, fast. Oh. Fast forward. Wait, maybe. Okay. Right. So, um, in 1940. June 1940, the Germans um, invaded France within, oh, I'm sorry, the, it took six weeks for the capitulation, but um, Hitler um, came to Paris in June 1940 and eight days later, the armistice was signed between France and Germany. And here you see on the left, Marshal Pétain. He had been the hero of the First World War. And it was assumed by many that he would help protect France in a paternalistic sort of way that he would help protect France from being dominated um, by the Germans, but it didn't exactly work out that way. So after the armistice of June 1940, France was divided largely into two, into two zones, the occupation zone and the so-called free zone. And this um, bifurcation or cutting France in half lasted for two years. It lasted until n November 1942. And why? Why did the Germans decide to all of a sudden occupy all of France? It was because in November 1942, um, the Allies invaded North Africa and thank you, <laughs> or liberated um, Morocco. And when this happened, the Germans saw that the Allies are now on the southern basin of the Mediterranean. So the Germans came down all the way to the northern Mediterranean basin. And also um, the Italian army, after November 1942, occupied the southeast corner of France which many people don't know that there was an Italian occupation. And for the Jews, it actually turned out to be, well, both good and bad, but I'll, I'll, get, to, I'll get to that. Um, so here we are um, with France divided in two. 
And as early as 1940, well, actually even earlier than that, there were internment, internment camps, labor camps, tens of thousands of, of Jews were interned in these camps. And also I just wanted to give you a, a flavor of the anti-Semitism of the period so that within a couple of months of the armistice, in actually October 1940, um, the Statut des Juifs um, actually um, um, was the first major anti-Jewish legislation that was aimed primarily at French Jews, and they were no longer allowed to work in public places, for example, or, pub or be in public service, such as they couldn't teach, they couldn't be in the government. So this was a big blow to um, French Jews, and shortly thereafter, the French Vichy government also enacted the Aryanization law, whereby French Jews could no longer own their businesses. They had to be taken over by an Aryan, by a non-Jew. And so this is an example of a, a pen repair shop that um, changed management. If you could read the signs from a Jewish to a non-Jewish um, business. And there, just to give you an example of the culture of anti-Semitism, a traveling exhibit called Le Juif et la France um, was considered a popular exhibit that was visited by children. And so this is an example of of a photo from the YIVO archives that shows this um, exhibit and well attended by well-dressed um, children. So I want to go back to the internment camps. And again, with these massive, massive internments, um, the French rabbis came together and decided they had to do something, and Vichy appointed certain chaplains um, who had the authority to visit the internment and labor camps. And although um, Schneerson was not one of the Vichy appointed chaplains, he interacted with them on a daily basis. And you can see correspondence amongst these rabbis having to do with bringing food and relief to those who were injured. You find this correspondence in the collection RG340. So in addition to providing, um, excuse me, to providing food, um, Schneerson and the other rabbis made sure that they distributed, for example, um, prayer shawls um, to fill in um, copies of the the Chumash so that observant Jews could continue to be observant of Shabbat and even of some of the the holidays, especially Passover. And I stopped um, at this photograph because it shows that Rabbi Max Ansbacher he was from Germany, and he was not part of a Vichy, he was not a Vichy appointed chaplain. He couldn't have been, he was German. He was an intern Jew. But what's really important, and I think brilliant of the chaplains, is that they had a whole hierarchy um, where they were the official rabbis, but within each camp, they had representatives from within the population of interned Jews. And I say that was brilliant because it gave the rabbis an opportunity to have like a, a, a daily pulse or surveillance on what was going on so that they were not dependent on information from, let's say, a government source. 
they had information from multiple sources, from the intern themselves, like Max Anbacher. And again, you can see correspondence about these issues in RG340. Now, during the winter of 1940-41, so it's the first winter after the armistice, as many as 3,000 Jews died from the harsh, the harsh conditions. And the rabbis tried to um, bring f food and medicine and clothing to the intern. But then again, there was anywhere between like 10,000 and 40,000 intern Jews. It was um, a large effort and it was very difficult. And this enterprise was largely funded by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee and their headquarters and archives are here in New York where you can also see this um, information. Um, now, Schneerson and the chaplains also tried to seek the release of Jews. They tried to find, um, they tried to help them with visas. And as I'm sure all of you know, it was very difficult to get a visa to leave, to, to leave France, to leave Germany. Um, so they, they tried to find relatives who would be able to sponsor. The, the Jews who were interned. So, so the point I'm making is that they went out of their way to do anything that they could to help these tens of thousands of interned Jews. And I highly recommend that you read the letters because they are heartbreaking, um, but they speak to a personal relationship between one person and Rabbi Schneerson saying, thank you for the package of sardines you sent it made me feel so good because I don't have family and I have no means of getting out of this camp. So to know that you care about me makes me feel better. And again, this is a form of spiritual resistance. Um, now, um, in 1942, um, the Vichy government passed a law requiring that all foreign male Jews between the ages of 18 and 45, that they be enrolled in forced labor companies. Um, they were known as GT, GTEs, or Groupement de Travailleurs Etrangers. And these are really a synonym for a, a labor camp. And what is ingenious is that Schneerson created a vocational school in Marseille, in, in the building that he rented or he owned in, in Marseille. Oh, here it is right here. I'll show you on Rue Sylvabel. Um, right, Rue Sylvabel. There was a vocational training school for both men and women. And what was ingenious is that he was able to get the authorization by a local Vichy bureaucrat to turn his vocational school to have it considered as one of the GTEs, as one of the, yeah, as one of the um, groupement de travailleurs étrangers. And it's, it's pure genius because then those, um, those men who were able to attend were able to get out of actually showing up at a work camp. So I, that's just one of the ways in which I thought that Rabbi Schneerson found clever ways to help people. I mean, he even wrote letters to the camp commander saying that um, you know certain women had to leave, they needed permission to leave in order to go to the mikvah. So he did everything that he could. And the fact that there was a Vichy official, uh, Monsieur Roux, R-O-U-X, who helped him shows you that within the bureaucracy, there were functionaries, fonctionnaires, who were um, open to helping Jews who were trying to get out of France or escape, um, you know, such as Monsieur Roux. 
Now, Schneerson hired um, Joseph Bass, an engineer, and I think he also had a law degree. He hired Joseph Bass, who was from the Soviet Union. And he was one of the vocational teachers at, um, you know, at this vocational school. And Joseph Bass is very important because he, I wish I had a photograph of him, he was, um, he created one of the largest groups of, one of the largest resistance networks in France called the Service André. So I don't think it's a coincidence that these um, Jews from the Soviet Union ended up knowing each other and working with each other and, and scheming to do things in an illegal way in order to help refugees or children. Now, um, I will show you also in Marseille, the orphanage. Um, uh, so this was a beautiful chateau, the Chateau de la Vieille Chapelle. Um, and this is where the children's home was between March 1942 and November 1942. I think this is where Professor Paldiel was. Is that correct? Marseille in this. Does it look familiar to you? Do you remember? <laughs> okay. So so the AIP home functioned as a boarding school, and it housed approximately 60 children, but at any one time, 60 children. But during the length of time of all of the children's homes from 1940 to 1944, certainly there were many more children who had been served. But at any one time, it could hold a maximum of 60, ch 60 children. He had a staff of about 10. and. Schneerson, Rabbi Schneerson, provided for each child's material, emotional, and spiritual needs. The rabbi, his family, and staff tried to comfort the children because, as I said, they understood that these children were traumatized by having been separated from their parents. So Rabbi Schneerson um, wanted to distract them both with study and with play and also light chores. So Schneerson's religious school, he had a religious school set up in the chateau. It taught secular and religious subjects, including French. The rabbi who had become fluent in French after his move to Paris insisted that the children, most of whom spoke Yiddish, that they learned French. So the children ate their meals and celebrated Shabbat and Jewish holidays with the Schneerson family. So by showing the children how to find joy in Judaism, Schneerson believed he could help them overcome or at least deal with their emotional pain. Celebration and observance were his way of providing spiritual resistance. And these are three of the children who um, he had saved. The photograph was taken during the war, during the war, not in Marseille, but at the next house that they went to in Demu, uh, which was closer to Spain. And Bertha Schwartz um, on the right corner, top right corner, um, is a very active public speaker and has done everything that she could to um, bring attention to the rescue work that has been performed by Rabbi Schneerson and his family. And it's actually, um, I, I learned so much from her and I regret that she was unable to attend this, this talk. Um, so by showing the children um, how to find joy in Judaism, again, Schneerson believed he could help them overcome their emotional pain. So celebration and observance were his way of providing spiritual resistance and instilling pride among the children, pride in their Jewish identity. And again, this is a time when, when you were felt as if your Jewish identity was something that was less than human. Um, 
so again, restoring their sense of self and Jewish identity was very important. And in testimonies that the children gave years later when they were adults, many of them said that it actually gave them that they left the, the war situation having lost everything, having lost their family, but that their sense of self and their sense of Jewish identity remained intact. And that was something that they could hold on to. So the, there's, there's so much to say. The, the roundups of foreign Jews in the unoccupied zone began in August 1942. And that basically brought an end to the relative safety of the Jewish homes. I'm, I'm sorry? Um, so free, fa I'm sorry, free France was Vichy France, yes. But everything really changed after July for all kinds of reasons. Everything seemed to change and get worse for Jews and deadly after July 1942, basically because, and, and you could read um, the exact um, description and chronology in Robert Paxton's book, Vichy France and the Jews, where he actually talks about the negotiations between top Vichy officials, like the Prime Minister Pierre Laval, with the um, Germans, and the negotiation was about how many tens of thousands of Jews the French would be able to willingly um, give to the Germans. Um, and so this really began the wave of deportation in July 1942. And perhaps you heard of the biggest Hafler, the biggest roundup, which was in Paris in 1942, where about, I believe, 13,000 Jews in Paris had been rounded up. But the French police um, promised the Germans maybe double the, the amount. And so you, know, you can look at my article to see the exact figures. Um, you know, probably they're, they're not accurate, but, but the, the main point is that the French police was unable to deliver the tens of thousands of Jews that they promised. So, in order to make up this deficit and to show the Germans how, um, how efficient they were, um, the Vichy government then started roundups in the free zone. So, and, and this started fiercely in August 1942 and September 1942. And as a matter of fact, um, Bertha Schwartz um, was staying in one of the hotels in Marseille, she and her two sisters, and she said that she was just terrified because they're just children and they were alone and they didn't know what would happen to them and they got separated from their mother and, um, and she, she would tell you that I believe it was that night or the next morning, these three, um, um, these three, um, I guess, Hasidic looking young men walked into the hotel and, and right away the children recognized that these were Jewish people who they could trust and they took, the three boys, took the three children directly to Rabbi Zalman Schmiersen. And within days, within days of their having been saved, there had been a hafla at that hotel. So, um, so, so this was a time when, when the um, the population of interned Jews after August 1942 drastically declines because between. 
July 1942 and March 1943, the Jews are being deported from the internment camps to the death camps um, in, in Poland. So that's the, the, the context of where, of, of what is, of, of daily life for the children, for Rabbi Schneerson. These are the challenges that he faces and that is why he went to extremes to help people, whether it was through legal or illegal, i.e. clandestine means. Um, Schneerson, I need to move this along. Um, I think I only have a few minutes. Oh, okay, thank you. So let me move this on and show you some more photographs. Um, so Fruma mentioned that the Felsenberg family is here. And this is a letter from the archive written by Rabbi Schneerson indicating that Mrs. Betty Felsenberg is of good character and please accommodate her you know, in this um, hotel. And fortunately, her three children um, survived because they were brought to Rabbi Schneerson's home. And although Mrs. Felsenberg was unfortunately deported to Auschwitz, thank goodness, she survived. And Fruma said that the Felsenberg family is here. Where are they actually? Oh, you're the Felsenberg family? Oh. <laughs> Are you a grandchild? Wow, thank you, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> wow, it, 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 I don't know what you could possibly be feeling when you see this letter. Um, and here's a letter from a child written to Rabbi Schneerson saying, you know, something to the effect that I miss you, I'm a good student, I'm studying Torah, I'm happy that my brothers are coming to my birthday party, I, I miss you, I please send my regards to the, the Rebbitzin, and she sends her kisses, her name is Judith. And you did, and you know this just shows that you know the the affection that the children had for the for the rabbi. And um, okay, really need to speed up. So <clears throat> um, after after 1942, when the Germans invade all of France, and then the Italian army, the southeastern part of France around Nice to Grenoble. Um, Schneerson feels that he has to get out of Marseille. So he goes to Demou, which is closer to the Spanish border. And then this is the chateau that they lived in. And what was, um, I think my favorite story about, two favorite stories about their living in the Chateau was that the night before 
it was decided that all of them, and maybe there were 60 or 70, but there were a lot of children and staff. So the night before it was decided that they would all leave and go to the area near Grenoble, which was under the Italian jurisdiction, the Italian occupation. The night before they had to leave, it was Purim. So Rabbi Schneerson made sure that no one told the children that they would be uprooted again because he did not want to upset them. He wanted to make sure that they were able to, to have joy in Purim. And that speaks volumes to me. And one of the interesting things about working in the archive is that I saw like this mimeograph list of the names of the children who were in the Purim play. And I remembered that Queen Esther was played by a little child, Bertha, okay, I forgot her maiden name, Bertha, whatever. And when I met Bertha Schwartz and she told me her maiden name, I realized that she was Esther. She was Queen Esther, as I found out in a car in Riverdale coming here to Yivo when I first met her. And the fact that Rabbi Schneerson held on to this list of, of like a, a playbill and, and left it in the, and kept it um, in the archive shows you the extent to which he was thinking about the future and wanted people to know that Jewish life still went on under the occupation on, in Vichy, France. Um, right, that's my favorite Purim story. So then for all kinds of reasons, it was just too dangerous to remain in Demu. Um, some of his staff um, were, some of his staff members were um, in, in, imprisoned and he realized they just had to leave and they went to um, Voiron. Um, oh, right, I was supposed to show you that earlier, the Germans invading. Um, and so here they are in Voiron, which is, um, you know, near the Alps. Um, and actually, life was pretty good. They were left alone, like between, um, between March 1943 and September 1943. Things were relatively stable in Voiron, and that's because they were under the jurisdiction of the Italians, and the Italians did not, did not deport Jews. So that is why they were safe in that, in that period. So September 1943, the Italians capitulate to the, the American, to the Americans, and you remember November 1942, the Allied armies are going through North Africa, so by September 1943, they've gone up through Italy, and the surrender um, of Italy to the Allied forces in September 1943 um, gave um, Schneerson cause for worry because he thought that if the Italians leave, the Italian troops leave the southeastern part of France where they were relatively safe, then the vacuum will be filled by the Germans. So he wanted to get out of, um, so he wanted to flee with all the children and the staff, and they did. They fled to Nice. So unfortunately, unfortunately, um, there were, there were Germans all over, there was the Gestapo all over, there was a huge, uh, Rafle in September 1943 in Nice. Um, it was very important to the SS 
that they get every Jew in Nice and deport them. So they were being very meticulous in hunting down Jews. Meanwhile, Schneerson, his family, his staff, and children were dispersed among many, many, many hotels. And now it's Rosh Hashanah, and Rama Schneerson is going to blow the shofar. And this is another favorite story that I have. And um, the people around him were worried because they were in hiding. They were in hiding, and actually the German, I don't remember if they were German military or if they were SS, but I do remember that they were within earshot of the hiding place. So everyone was nervous that Rabbi Schneerson was going to blow the shofar. But again, this is a savvy person we're dealing with. And he memorized the train timetable. So he blew the shofar. Yeah, when the train came and blew its horn. Yeah. So yeah, nice story of you know just how you know savvy he is. And then he brings in all of the spirituality down to the material world, which the shofar is supposed to do. So he 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 did what he was supposed to do and oh excuse me um no i'll just okay um they okay so so now they're dispersed in marseille uh, i'm sorry nice nice 1943 nice they're dispersed in in little hotels all over nice and it's hard to communicate with each other, and they have to get the hell out, excuse me, they had to get out of Nice and go back to um, the Voiron near Grenoble. And it was the resistance network of Joseph Bass, known as the Service André, that actually rescued them. So here you have Joseph Bass, if you remember, the um, engineer lawyer from the Soviet Union who, who fled an internment camp in, in France and then went to meet Rabbi Schneerson because he knew Rabbi Schneerson was making um, false identity cards and, and then became the, the teacher. You remember the teacher at the vocational school and said, all right, um, I'm going to I'm going to create a resistance network, and he did. It was so big and so vast that it actually um, integrated, you, you might have heard of the Protestant town, um, um, Chambord-sur-Lignon, the Protestant town um, sort of toward the center of France, that as a complete town, the Protestants decided that they were going to save all of the Jews in their town, and they did, and they basically told the Vichy government and Vichy police, like, sorry, we're not cooperating with you, and they didn't, and their Jews were, were saved. So the Service André actually included them in this um, Service André network. And historian Leon Polyakov, who had worked for Rabbi Schneerson for two years as his right-hand man. He left Schneerson um, in 1942 so that he could join Bass and join the resistance. So that's what happened to Leon Polyakov. And fortunately, a year, almost a year later, September 1943, now Schneerson, family, staff, and children were rescued by this network. And uh, Leon Polyakov in his memoir states that it took weeks in order to move everyone out of their hiding places and brought back to, to Voiron. And one of the stories I remember Hadassah telling me was that the um, y yeshiva bocha who had studied with Schneerson, I, I guess she, she must have been in a hiding place with them because she told me, if I remember correctly, that she went with them in a car and they did not want to cut their payas or their beards, um, but Rabbi Schneerson actually sent a message that it was acceptable to do that because they were saving their own lives. But they refused to do that. And if I remember correctly, um, Hadassah told me 
that they disguised themselves, um, like they had bandages around their head, and that they had been stopped by the French police en route back to um, Foiron. And, and Hadassah said that it was just so obvious that they were wearing disguises that the French police like knew these were Jews escaping and said, okay, you know, vas-y, fine. So in Voiron, um, in Voiron, um, the children had to be dispersed among four hiding places because it was no longer acceptable or safe for children to be in a in a house like in this chateau or um, there was the school children at the beginning oh like these children if they were all in you know in hiding a, a large group in a home it would be easier to find them um, and and then they would be deported so once they got to Voiron, so between September 1943 and the liberation in June 1944, the children were dispersed and some of the um, yeshiva bocha were in charge of different groups. Hadassah was um, in charge of another group and I know this is where Hadassah was riding her, excuse me, riding her bicycle to deliver food to deliver medicine that was needed. And again, it's life defying to be riding your bicycle on a country street when you know that the, that the Milis and the Gestapo are everywhere and that they are intent on finding every Jew, whether it's the Milis. The Milis was the paramilitary unit um, of the French police. It was separate from the police. Um, actually, the police at Voiron helped Rabbi Schneerson, and he says that um, after the war, um, but the milice was separate from the police, and um, they were absolutely vicious, and, and um, yeah, just as vicious as the Gestapo. So with Hadassah riding her, her bicycle, knowing that the Milis and the Gestapo were everywhere. I mean, she just could have been caught at any time and deported. And unfortunately, in uh, 20, March 22nd, 1944, um, two things happened, and that is um, the rabbi's wife, Rebetzin Sarah Schneerson, was found by the Milis. And again, they're like thugs, military thugs. And, um, and on the same day, there was a Gestapo raid on one of the hiding places called La Martelière. And unfortunately, 17 of Schneerson's group of children were caught and deported. Only one survived. So these two things happened on the same day. Uh, if they're related to each other, no one can say conclus conclusively, but there's an excellent authoritative historian, Tal Bratman, a French historian, who speaks about both um, events, and he thinks that it was a coincidence because the um, Milice and Gestapo were not necessarily um, planning activities together, and he, um, this historian Tal Brutman, made a big point of stressing how just evil the Milice were, that they were less interested in deporting a Jew than in humiliating them and torturing them. So that was their motive in, in a, arresting in, in, in taking um, the rabbits in. And unfortunately, she was, she was tortured for a few days. Um, and there are actually judicial records. Um, you'd have to go to France to see them. Um, the US Holocaust Museum did not have a copy of them, unfortunately, because um, I, well, so, um, it's just unfortunate that this is what happened to Sora Schneerson, but the fact that she 
did not divulge the whereabouts of her husband speaks to her courage. She actually told them that her husband fled to Switzerland, which was absolutely untrue. So again, she is a heroine. She is a heroine. And after she came back, um, it was amazing that they even, that the Milice released her after she came back to, um, to find Hadassah. She told Hadassah, look, you have to be careful because they have a photograph of you and they are, they are after you. Um, and one um, important thing that, there's just so much, there's so much to say, and I'm actually leaving out um, a lot just to um, get in, um, I guess, what is most in, important. And um, when Hadassah's mother was taken by the police, this is again one of my favorite stories, Hadassah was outraged and I don't know if she ran to the police station or if she went on her bicycle to the police station, but she went to the police station and she demanded to know where her mother was. That's Hadassah Schneerson, Hadassah Kalbach. I hope I got that right, Hadassah. <laughs> so um, to, um, to, to sum up, um, Schneerson um, was actually successful in smuggling nearly half of the children who had been under his care by the time they returned back to um, Voiron near Grenoble. So he was able to get half of them over to Switzerland between September 1943 and April 1944. Um, he, he, he did not want to, um, he did not want to place Jewish children in monasteries because he feared that he might not be able to find them afterwards, or he feared that their Jewish identity would be submerged. So that is one of the reasons why, when he was offered the opportunity to hide his children in a monastery, actually the Service André wanted him to, to hide the children in a monastery, and he said, no, absolutely not. And that was really good because within a couple of days, um, the monastery had been, um, there was a hafle, a roundup at that monastery, which meant that there was an informer, someone, someone from the Sylvie Sandre, someone told the, um, the, the Gestapo or the French police to go to that monastery. Yes? Oh, time's up? Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't pay it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize it was this late. Um, okay, time's up. So all this to say that Schneerson and his family were successful in saving many Jewish children and helping hundreds, if not thousands, of interned Jews. And if they were able to do this, it was because of the fact that they were within they were operating with other organizations in France and, and across the globe, well, especially with the United States and the joint. And I'm sorry, I didn't have time to tell you about some of the post-war activities. Good evening. And thank you everyone for coming. I just feel like anyone who is interested in what happened in the Holocaust is part of my family. I want to thank our hosts, the Evil Organization, and I want to thank John Ubrand, the director and CEO. And I'm really, I was scared talking about Russia in front of him. He wrote two books. I read one and a half of them. Uh, I'm grateful for the family of Ruth Gay. They should be blessed recognizing how important it is to our 
the future generation should know what happened to their grandparents, the great grandparents, and all the Jewish people. So, and I want to thank Mom and her and her assessments. And I want to tell you, she's a miracle worker. She managed to use 15 minutes to tell me what I have to say in five. <laughs> I love you, Mama. <laughs> so we negotiated it's going to be 10, OK? Thank you. So I really want to start a little bit about the, the back, my father's years, the early years in Russia. And his rebellion started, I think, in the womb already. Because my grandmother used to say that seven children would have been easier for her than this one. First, she, she, okay. He was born with a congenital hip condition. I guess made, that made him difficult also. This, this condition is treated now with, a, with braces for about three months, and the, ki and the kids are all right. I, I hear an echo. Do you hear it there also? No? It's just on me. OK. I guess I'm right. And they lived in, in the, he was born in 1898, and they lived in Chernigov, which was probably part of Ukraine in those days. And my father, at the age of 15, was very unhappy with the school that he attended. <laughs> it was a modern yeshiva where kind of emancipated a little bit. And let's get, f and why he wasn't at yeshiva, I think it's because already that came to, to my grandfather was actually a rabbi, uh, but he was an official rabbi. He was the one who used to sign on birth certificates and marriage. And, but there was abject poverty in the house. There were five children, my father and uh, an older brother, and three sisters. So at age 15, my father heard about Lubavitch, and he said to his parents, this is not enough for me. The secular education is wonderful. The Jewish education is diluted. I want to go to Lubavitch. And the father said, mm, we're a little bit more modern. Possibly he said that. I'm imagining and so on. Anyway, they, for a while, they, they resisted. So my father had no choice. You, and this is the intriguing thing that you said about him, the way he was. He tried to commit suicide. He committed suicide, actually. He drank a bottle of ink. I don't think there was anything else available for him in those days. After, after they popped him or whatever, revived him, they dispatched him very fast in Shiva before the whole city finds out about it. You know, as in the Yiddish expression, espasnish is not becoming Rabbi's family to this and that. And, and then the Stalin years came, the communism came. And, and uh, I, this is a, a very long story, but let's make it, make it short, is that it, it became dangerous. The Yevsexia, the section, the Jewish section of the very ardent, almost fanatical communist was very virulent. And they confiscated the Jewish synagogues. They closed the yeshivas. There was no mikvah anymore. And it was dangerous to congregate together to learn. Uh, and mostly they, they targeted the young children and the young, 
or, and teenagers to, to get them involved in the party. My father's brother took that way, the different way from my, from my father. My father's brother, to skip a few years, he became a card-carrying communist. He, he, he went up high in the ranks. He married um, even a more fanatical communist than he was. And, but she did not think that he was uh, a staunch communist enough to her taste. And rumor is that it was she who denounced him later when he was shot in Burgess. The three sisters, two followed my father's way, and one was close to the older brother. My father married in, in, uh, in 1920, I have, I think, 1920 from my father, probably, yeah. At that time, he was working for the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe at that time, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson. And he became very attached and very devoted to him. He became a real chassid. And he got, he got married and started his underground work. The Babacha Rebbe fought against the situation very, very strongly. And the kind of things he did, I'll get to some later, but one thing, he was a very good friend to his friends. And because his legs were shorter, one leg was shorter, he used to present himself for the draft so they can get a dispensation for his friends. You know, the identity papers, or there were no photos in those days on the papers. It became kind of he used to go from the different cities and it became a little bit dangerous and already get the move because how many limping Jews are there, you know? Easy to identify him. So time went, went on and, it, and it's like six years later, 1928, and they still don't have a child. And this, I'll tell you, that this is kind of story of my birth and my birthdays, the many, et cetera. And so at one Purim, at a Fabrengen, at a Jewish gathering, the, his friend said to him, go up, go to the rabbi, ask for a child. And he's, he was yet, he didn't, you know, he was still new being a chassid, okay, because he can, he thought he's going to be bothering the rabbi. But finally they egged him on and he said, you know, one especially, and he went up to the rabbi and he asked for it. And the rabbi said, oh, hi, this year, in a year you're going to have a child, something to that effect. And guess what? This, I was born in 1927. It's like 10 months later. But it wasn't so simple. They were living in Leningrad. At that time, there were about 16,000 Jews living officially with permission in Leningrad, but probably like double that or, or there illegally. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe was among them. He was living there. So my father, of course, wherever the rabbi is, he followed him, he did work for him. We'll talk about his work in a little while. Uh, so here, um, my mother is about to give birth and they have problem finding an apartment. It's not because he's there illegally, it's very hard to put an apartment. Finally, they found something, but it was unofficial. He didn't have a paper that he was registered in an apartment. And my mother goes into labor and it's January in Leningrad, and, and she, on a horse-drawn wagon, a hay wagon, she, she goes, they, goes through from hospital to hospital, and they refuse to take her in. She's in labor with a long awaited child. Well, everything 
helps with a little with a bribe. With a bribe, they found a doctor who, del who agreed to deliver the baby, but he couldn't do it in his office. God forbid that somebody or co-workers will see that she got her, smuggled her in, in a back, uh, some sort of uh, lean to a shack. And he was wearing, he delivered the baby when he was wearing a heavy, in Russian they call it a shuba, it's a heavy fur, fur coat. And, and when the baby was born, somehow inadvertently one head of, this, of his fur went into my chest and I had, a, I came home with a big infection and that was when I was born. And that was January 12th, 1927. But I did not have a birth certificate. He couldn't give me one. So I was e illegal. I mean, I was probably legitimate, but illegal. Until a year later, in another city where my father's sister lived with her husband, Rabbi Neville, she was due to have a baby, and so my parents traveled there. They knew she was going to have a baby with a midwife, and my cousin was a boy, was born. They gave the midwife a little bit a little bribe there also. And there I had a birth certificate, January 25, 1928. And that followed me all my life. And added to my confusion was another, another thing is that the way, it sort of indicate to you the way a Hasid thinks, feels about his Rebbe, that when they used to ask my father, how old is your daughter? He would start saying, he was counting it with a different calendar altogether. Not this solar, cal solar cal uh, calendar, God forbid, but, and not even a regular lunar cal uh, calendar. It's by the years of what, what the Rebbe was at this year, what the Rebbe was doing at this year, what book the Rebbe, Safer the Rebbe finished at this year. So he used to say, well, the Rebbe was in, in Leningrad at this and this year, and then he left Leningrad then, and she was born then and then and then. So for years, I couldn't figure out where, when I was born. <laughs> Most of the years that I remember is running from place to place, I mean, traveling from place to place, is my early, my early years. It, it, my father was doing some dangerous work. He was a, li a liaison between the yeshivas, between the underground yeshivas, and the, the previous Rabbi, Rabbi Yosef Yeska he uh, had many uh, adherents, and they had, and there were many of these yeshivas, and just uh, that needed to be supported, and money had to be channeled to them, and that money used to come in from the joint HADC, and it had to be distributed clandestinely, and it was difficult converting dollars into rubles, that was the most dangerous thing is having, uh, owning, having, dealing in dollars. Uh, and this was part, one of his jobs. And interesting that the, the other Yosef, Joseph who was in his life, the second Joseph that was in his life was Dr. Joseph Rosen, who was a director also of the, of the Joint. He was an agronom who had dealings with the Russian government. And he would frequently come, and, and he was the one, I think, that was the connection, the liaison. And this was like a holy word in our house. Dr. Rosen, all my life, 
I knew him. Uh, later on, I'm going to skip a little bit, where my father, had, my father had this way is, spend first, pay later. You know, it's before the credit cards had, uh, advanced, he, or he invented that system. So it, that he incurred a lot of borrowed money always, and whenever something, an emergency came up, he would, he would take care of it, he would spend it. And in the end, he had to, had to pay up, get an accounting. And Dr. Rosen saved his life many times, pulled him out of it. So this was, this was like our, our life. At one point, I remember we lived in Malachovka, which is a suburb of uh, Moscow, like a, a two-hour train ride. I, know, I think now it's a suburb. And it, it, we had, in, in that little house, we had a little, a little a part of a house, because there was like other people in the house. We had a, we had a, we had a shul. <laughs> We had a school. We had for bringing Hasidic gatherings all the time, and all clandestinely, and and all with a fear of any day we, we may just be dis discovered, and the fear. And it wasn't just the fear, because we had very frequent visits from the. Uh, that time is the GPU, later became in Cabade, but it was the GPU at that time. And I remember very frequently that uh, they came, and thank, some of the times my father wasn't home, and some of the times he was home. When he wasn't home, my mother would see them coming in the front. She would leave me in charge of my brother, who was five years younger, and she would run to to intercept my father not to come home. And they would ask me, where's, where's your father? Where's your mother? And I think I learned to shrug my shoulders then. I mean, you know, for a while, that's all my co communication was, shrugging my shoulders. So I learned very early to not to, not, not to speak. It's still hard for me, as you see. Uh, and sometimes when they came, they took my father back with him. They arrested him. And that's what I wanted uh, a little bit. It's not clear in Harriet's paper that he, he talked himself out. Not of the arrest. The arrest, he was arrested. He talked himself out of incarceration, of being taken away and sent to Siberia or some other place. And so, uh, so this was a time, and in, in some of his papers, I think he gives a number of 12, the 12 times he was actually arrested. And this is, was a very, a very, very scary, scary time. And later on, when we moved to Moscow, it wasn't much better. In Moscow, we, uh, he had to have a front, he had to have a job. So I guess his job was, well, all of a sudden, in our small apartment, we were, we were joined by a, a huge knitting machine sitting in the middle of the living room. Supposedly, he was, he was a knitter, and he produced that. And I think, actually, Dr. Rosen was also involved in organizing a knitting factory for the Jews in Russia. In Russia maybe that was part of it. And my mother had to, had to work too. Everybody had to have working paper. My mother was a photographer. There was in that room was a box with a schmata, something you put uh, over, your, over your head. She was not a good photographer. All oh, her pictures used to come out and had white flecks like snow on them. But uh, this was in the house. And again, we very frequently visited by the uh, unwelcome and for, uh, uh, people. Informers were everywhere. And, and not just 
non-Jewish people, our own Jews, unfortunately, became, some of them became informers. You could not trust your own family, as you see with my uncle, but we could trust my uncle. He was still, through all, throughout all this, he still had a good relationship with, uh, with us. We left him behind, and that's when he was, he was shot. And so this was part of, the, uh, of, our, of, of our life. It was, very, it was a very dangerous time. Okay. okay. Um, I just want to try to stay within my time. Okay. So I will conclude this part. It's, there's so much more to say. I think my, I heard my sister Lois in the audience, and my mother didn't tell me a lot of things, but she told her she may know more, more stories than I know. Uh, the, the tragic part was when finally, after a lot of uh, Applications, and by the way, because my father had such a sec uh, secular, a uh, good background, so all, all other Jews used to come to our house all the time to fill out the forms because they couldn't couldn't write, they didn't couldn't read or write Russian or whatever it is, or whatever. And so he 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 used to fill out these forms and we, multiple applications for himself. And I think it was somehow with political help for Dr. Rosen, and probably he also paid for our passage on the ship. We, we got permission to uh, leave Russia. And this was before Pesach, and my mother prepared wine, and she prepared matzah, and she knew we are gonna be, have, uh, be Pesach on the ship. That's how the cards, can we have to take Whatever you got, the passage, you had to take it, you know. You know. So she was prepared to, uh, prepared, uh, prepared all this, and the time comes, and, and uh, my father, leave, uh, we left the house, we left, we left the apartment, we left the apartment, we went, we came to the station, it's so hard, that's hard for me to talk or the station, we board, we board the train with all these pack of the packages. And the train is about to depart, and the then Kavade is there, and they call oh, his name, yes, and was it this, come with us. I think this was the only time I saw him a mother on the, on the brink of collapse and so on this. And my mother started grabbing the uh, matzah and the, and the white and the rest of the packages to, to get off the train, to follow my father. And my father turns around and says, Four, go. Ich will euch noch jagen. I'll catch up with you. Thank God he did. He came, this was before Shabbos. We had a very, very sad Shabbos in Odessa, not knowing whether he's gonna come or not. I think he came on Tuesday, or and we had a lot, we gave ourselves lots of time, and we departed, we had Seder on, on the bus. To, I would recommend to everybody to read a book that People, uh, personal stories, I think of seven people, that what they went through, the people that were attached to the Babacha Rebbe that worked for him, what they went through in Russia. In Russia. And the book is called uh, In the Shadow of the, of the Kremlin. It says, you can still get it on Amazon. It, it is. It is such a moving book. They, these are simple people, but
but they were giants in self-sacrifice. Some of these people, because they worked for the rabbit, were sent away, what they would call sulka, banishment. It was sent away. Some that were lucky had for, sometimes their family with them for part time, but some were separated for their, from their families seven or more years from their wife and children and so on. This, this was a chapter. Okay, we have a few good years in France where I started talking after coming from, from Israel, Israel, at that time, Palestine. And this was very hard for me to, to talk about because I suffered for a survival guilt. And until one day, Bertha Schwartz, this wonderful young girl that became, an affordable, became a wonderful woman, called me and, uh, and Bertha, do you remember me? Do you remember that I was Queen Esther in the, the play? And she kind of shamed me because I wasn't telling anybody the story about my father. So here, so here I am. Um, I just want to tell you, you know, what the things that I had to do sometimes, I have to skip the, skip a little bit the early places and let's get to Chateau Saint-Yabon. And, and interesting about Chateau Saint-Yabon, that one day the uh, French Adar came to look to arrest my father and they thought he, he was Isaac Schneerson who was his cousin, who was in hiding like uh, 100, 100 kilometers away in another, another place. And finally, my father showed him his paper, convinced me he wasn't Isaac Schneerson, and he let, he let him go. I mean, very fast, my father sent a message to Isaac Schneerson to, to, to run away, and he went to the, to the uh, Grenoble side right away. And he, and he said, that's where he was saying. Um, I'm going to work through some tools and implements backwards that I had to learn through my through my teenage years. So in in the Chateau Saint Yvon, my my job was you know besides every the pitching hay and everything is. I, I uh, had to assist a doctor. Somehow, I, I always felt there was a stronger one that I could take it, you know. So they called on me to assist the doctor record a certain uh, uh, procedures because nourishment, we were all undernourished. And because of that, the children w would get some very fast, some uh, boils, carbuncles, Impetigo, I had to learn how to treat impetigo, and I had to learn how to use a scalpel to lance the boils. That's one of, one of my occupation there. I learned some other tools, the things that I was doing. I learned how to use a scythe, how to pitch, to cut the grass, how to pitch the hay, and uh, you know, you know, okay. Uh, uh, and you know, there was also uh, always a problem that was uh, no uh, inside plumbing, and we could go to the well to get the water, know how to get the pail uh, without dropping it out of the well. I learned a lot of things. So, uh, 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 all right. Later, of course, our time there. Yeah, so they see the podium. The, two minutes? Okay, okay. The, the podium party was, 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 more, was wonderful. My, I wanted to, my father wrote the play. He wrote the play for the children, you know. It's not only that he, 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 we didn't have access to anything. That's right, and he wrote a very, very funny play. It was with lots of laughs, uh, you, you know. No. If Eva doesn't have it, no. 
Okay. And, uh, and then and then let's get her to play to the time where where we had to separate and we could not be together anymore in the Chateau de Manoir in that uh, comfortable chateau, so to speak, comfortable. And we were in these higher up in, in, in these hamlets above Boiron, above, you know, Grenoble, high, higher up in, in the Alps. Uh, many times I was with, with older girls, and, but my job was always bathroom, bathroom job. In the middle of the night, I had to get out in winter and go to an outhouse and then I top of a mountain and it's beautiful and the moon is shining and everything is, it looks gorgeous, but, but, the, people, but the girls are afraid of, of animals, and not only of you know, Germans on the least, but animals, animals, they're afraid of them. Like the last home that I was with, we had to change homes many, few times, they, they only had four names, I think that we were, in, in the interim there were other places. And so we had, I was in charge of the home myself, and I just got a call from one of the young, a little boy, the four-year-old that was there, he called me about a half a year ago from Nebrak, and he said, I want to sing to you the song that your father taught us, and he sang me the song that my father told him that was him. It's very moving. Okay, but I had to get water. Uh, okay, again, the, the water. We had, I had, to, we had to make, I had to make fire with, with wood. I had to collect the twigs. I had learned how to use an axe to fell the trees. I learned how to use a saw, this a saw to cut the logs, and again the axe to split the logs. I had. To, I had to do all these things in order to care with the children, and, and but I but I didn't do the cooking. There was a, I had a, uh, another young girl to help with the cooking, and she was a marvelous cook. She can make a Hungarian goulash of just potatoes and onions and water. She would brown the potatoes with water, but it took like an hour and a half of stirring. But she lovingly did it, and we had. Hungarian goulash. Uh, had to take care of the laundry. You had to encourage them to, you know, to eat with sometimes not very good food. Okay, uh, and, and 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 then I had to teach them. My father insisted on a program every day that you have to teach, but he had to teach without pencil, without papers, without books, without just a homish and a. Uh, and a sitter, uh, a Bible book, you know, the way that's her, and, and a sitter, and, and and nothing, and and I had to make do with that, and why my feeble knowledges of uh, of arithmetic, I, I knew that much yet for the younger kids, but uh, that, so that's okay, uh, and and and, and then once in a while the kids got sick. Surprisingly, we did not get any serious sicknesses, and we didn't have colds. We had other things, but no colds. We don't know why. No cold. But so for, then, when the kid had fever, when I felt this is when I had to call go a, a doctor. The doctor was like uh, a couple miles down uh, in Boulogne. I remember his one. His name Francois. I think his last name was Francois. We were told, you know, my father found out that he, he could trust him, and he was kind, and he'd give us medicine. But to get to him, after they arrested my mother, I had to be doubly careful. First of all, because I had to discard my winter coat that was somehow in that there was nothing that was available. It was a loud plaid. That wasn't something to, to wear when you don't want to be visible. So that was... That was out. Uh, secondly, I, I, I had, I had to, uh, I had to uh, descend for the, that big hill at night, not during the day, uh, because I really already they have my photographs in that castle. 
And this is the time where winter, what I could not do is on the road, a bicycle. This is the, the, the road that I could take at night because it was a safer road. And it was a very twisty road going up, steep, steeply, steeply. And one time, I, I, one time I got so scared, I know, I turned back and I saw headlights, and headlights can only be the enemy. And I, headlights were so far away, but I didn't realize uh, that they were far away. I thought that I was exposed there on top of the mountain, and in the middle of the bed, they see me, and I was really scared. But, you know, there's one thing, the whole thing, I was scared so many things. I, my father said, he said, it's not a fear, he said, yes, it's scary, you have to do it anyway, you have to do it anyway, I want to do it anyway. So that's what it is, and I'm, so in conclusion, I want to say what it means to me, this finding gate and evil having the, the papers, and, and they are not, they're not just pieces of paper. They are not just scraps. That each, this is something he takes, but my father, I don't know how he carried it from place to place. He didn't carry any photographs of the, the, the albums of children or herself place to place. How did he manage to carry it? I still cannot figure out this one of the mysteries you know, that I'll never, I'll never find out. But each piece of paper is a testament to the faith that he had in God, the faith that one day somebody will read it, the faith, the faith that good is still to come. Thank you. I want to add one thing where we're of interest. I would like to say it, Dr. O'Neill. There were three people with the name of Yosef that were instrumental in, to help my father. The, the, of course, the, the previous Lubavitcher Rabbi, Rabbi Yosef, Dr. Rosen, Rabbi, uh, his name was Joseph Rosen, and Joseph Schwartz. Three, three Rosen. I love what Dr. Pardiel wrote about Joseph Schwartz. Dr. Pardiel's book is a must to read. But he, he, has, he has a note about me, and I don't have to read the book from Wikipedia anymore to find my name. He, he is more accurate. So. <laughs> One second. But he, he writes about Joseph Schwartz because I find that he's like a soul brother to my father. Joseph Schwartz, he was not beyond changing, ignoring, or re reinterpreting directives from New York headquarters. Consonant, he was, it was consonant with the realities of my uh, time. I'll be very brief. First, my thanks to Ivo, to Mr. Jonathan Brent, and to the Ruth Gay family, whose generous support of this program has made possible tonight's seminar. Having listened attentively to the lectures of both Harry Jackson and Hadassah Kalabach and the brief minutes allotted to me, I only wish to make several points. From the academic perspective, the Zalman Schneerson story reinforces the need for a further in-depth study of this remarkable person who was steeped both in the traditional Judaism as well as rescue activities. His various contacts with persons, Jewish and non-Jewish, some of them supporters of the Vichy regime, coupled with his imaginative ideas on Jewish survival in the post-war era, these endeavors came to light in a man who combined both charm, intelligence, and determination 
that led others to cooperate with him in his rescue efforts. It's well to, rem to remember that in contrast to other Jewish rescue activists in France, Rabbi Schneerson was not a part of the, of the traditional Jewish establishment in that country, the way he had arrived a few years before the war. But he acted mostly on his own, while allying to his cause persons who were more recognizable establishment figures, such as Raymond Raoul Lambert of the UGIF and representatives of the Joint, Hayes, and other Jewish refugee organizations, as well as non-Jewish assistance committees, such as the American Friends Service, better known as the Quakers. There is no doubt that, that his previous bitter experience in confrontation with Soviet authorities while in Russia, which led to his arrest uh, many times, and to which thanks to the way he articulated before his captors the innocence of the charges sustained against him that led to his release on several occasions, that these, that these, that these experiences stood him in good stead as he was able to convince some of the Vichy authorities such as Mr. Roux of the French police, to allow him to continue to take care of his Jewish wards under the guise of this or that Vichy ordinance. On a personal note, I too benefited from his help when as a five-year-old child in Marseille uh, during the early summer months of uh, 1942, I stayed in his children's home named La Vieille Chapelle on the outskirts of Marseille while my father was busy trying to get out of the country with the help of a Cuba visa. I have recently discovered in the Yivo archives copies of letters written by Rabbi Schneerson addressed to the uh, Jewish uh, Distribution uh, Committee, the Joint, and Heisem, uh, in other words, uh, Hayes, and dated February 1942, asking for financial assistance to my family to pay for the travel cost of such a voyage. The negative response by the Joint forced my family, after thank thanking Rabbi Schneerson, to seek succor in other ways. And this led to our move to the Italian zone of France, where we stayed a lengthy period before making our way across the Swiss border in September 1943 with the assistance of a French Catholic clergyman. I must admit that although I remembered dimly being in a children's home, at a very young age in France, I did not know the name of that place until my elderly sister told me over a cup of coffee at the kosher Dunkin' and Donuts on 34th Street that she visited me with my father at a place called La Vieille Chapelle. Unfortunately, both my parents had already passed away, so I could not elicit more information from them on their contacts with Robert Schneerson. But I did find some notes mentioning my family in the Zalman Schneerson archives here at YIVO. When I worked at Yad Vashem, I first came across the name of Zalman Schneerson when we honored a non-Jewish French woman named May Charretier, who assisted the rabbi when she helped him spirit the children out of Nazi-occupied Nice, and also when she arranged the smuggling of children across the border into Switzerland such as one member of the Felsenberg family. At that time, I still did not know of my family's connection with Rabbi Schneerson while we were staying in Marseille, to where we had arrived from other places in France after fleeing from Antwerp, Belgium, where I was born. While at work at Yad Vashem as the head of the Righteous Among the Nations Department, Chassideo Mota I came across many other names of Jewish rescue activists who worked in tandem with non-Jewish rescuers, some of, the, of whom were honored by Yad Vashem. Some of these Jewish activists came from a, a strong religious background, such as Rabbi uh, Michael Dovber Weissmandl in Slovakia, or Zerich Wahrhaftig in Poland, to mention a few, or of a secular background, such as the Bundist Vladka Mead, and many others in various countries under German domination. There being no program to honor these stalwart Jewish rescuers, we cannot do it under the righteous program of Yad Vashem, which honors only non-Jewish rescuers, I decided to write a book on major Jewish rescuers under the title of Saving One's Own, which came out last year. On this occasion, 
I am pleased to donate a copy of this book to YIVO and thanks for their care of the vast Zalman Schnellson archives that is currently undergoing digitalization and their dedication to highlight Jewish life in various religious and cultural fields prior to the Holocaust. Last evening, I wrote to my colleagues at the Raoul Wallenberg Foundation, with which I am also associated, asking them to also organize a ceremony of placing a tablet on the outer wall near the entrance of the still existing house of La Vieille Chapelle, under the foundation's program of Houses of Life, where many Jewish persons were sheltered during the Shoah. The Raoul Wallenberg Foundation has already done it to many such homes in various places in Europe. And this morning I received a positive response. And if there's a, such a ceremony in Marseille, with the assistance of the Jewish community, of course I'll be there and I'll give a little talk in French. I still know French. In closing, I hope that very soon a Jewish educational institute, especially a yeshiva, will bear the name of the unforgettable Rabbi Zalman Schneerson, so that future Jewish generations will learn more of him and follow his example of one's Jewish fundamental religious obligations, as expressed in the Talmudic dictum, Kol Yisrael Arevim Zei Bazei, all Jews are responsible for one another. Thank you.